we now have a, a talk uh, by Dan O'Shea from uh, working with uh, Carl Dyseroth and David Sicillo and others. Thank you. Thank you for the organizers. Um, so on Friday, Carol Svoboda, I think, beautifully articulated the importance of thinking about neural computations that span multiple interconnected brain regions. And I think as a field, we're becoming more cognizant that no brain region can function on its own. Instead, nearly every behavior implicates a network of recurrently interconnected brain regions, each with individually interesting dynamics. But the complexity of these interacting circuits poses quite an analytical challenge as well. Fortunately, it's now becoming possible to record many neurons from many regions all over the brain with millisecond resolution. And so with the advent of these brain-wide data sets, I think there's an opportunity, as well as a challenge, in trying to use them to shed some insight on how these distributed neural computations are performed. One caveat to this is while certainly some of the ongoing dynamics we observe in spiking activity are going to be task-related, some of them are not going to be. Even a well-trained well animal's brain will never really be an engine for solely performing the task of interest. Instead, the brain is still preoccupied with many other responsibilities. So our approach here, at least initially, is to model the neural data directly by using modern statistical methods to find a dynamical system capable of generating the spiking activity we've recorded. We believe this data-driven approach will yield insights into those dynamics, and from there, into the computations that drive behavior. The data set that I've been working with was collected entirely by Will Allen in the Carl Dyser Othen Leach in Lowe's lab. Will did these recordings using neuropixel probes, which enable recording from hundreds of neurons at once along their length. For each recording session, the probe is dipped in dye before penetrating, and then using tools developed by Michael Chen, also in Carl's lab, the 3D insertion trajectory of each recording can be reconstructed and registered against brain segmentation maps from the Allen Institute. So this data set is exciting, not only because there are nearly 24,000 neurons, but also because each cell is labeled with which of these 34 brain regions that were sampled it came from. So let me briefly describe the tasks these mice were engaged in. The mice are presented with one of two odors. If they get the go odor, they can lick during the response period for water. If they get the no-go odor, no reward is given. On the right, here is a lick raster in a trained animal. You can see it licks successfully for hundreds of go trials while it's thirsty, and then rather abruptly stops when it is sated. So this setup provides a trial-by-trial -trial readout of motivational drive, and the neural data gives us a brain-wide picture of how this drive modulates sensory to motor processing throughout the brain. There's a lot of analysis that Will did with uh, this data set, but one takeaway point is that even though the task itself is a simple one, the circuitry implicated in motivated behavior is complicated, with many regions comprising a dense, recurrently interconnected network. So now we'd like to build a model that uses a dynamical system to produce all of this brain-wide spiking activity. For that, our workhorse is going to be LFADS, which you can think of as a technique for training a recurrent neural network to produce spiking data. So I'm not going to dive into all, of the, all the details, but I can explain the more intuitive decoder side. We start with the recorded spiking data. We treat these as samples from a Poisson process with a time-varying rate for each neuron. We then posit that these rates are readouts of a lower dimensional set of time-varying factors, which serve as the latent neural population state. These factors we then try to produce using an RNN, which serves as our nonlinear dynamical system. The initial condition for the RNN, as well as inferred time-varying inputs, are specified by the other half of the algorithm, the encoding side. And then all of the parameters that define these sequential transformations are learned from data. So there's one more challenge with this kind of brain-wide data we need to consider, which is that although we have many neurons for many brain regions, they're not recorded all simultaneously. And more importantly, brain regions themselves are sampled rather sparsely in each recording session. For example, this highlighted session samples only neurons in five of the 34 regions. So this is a cartoon that I think helps to visualize the situation, where each colored dot is a neuron. I find it helpful to think of all the neurons we recorded throughout the brain here as being the fully populated vector on the left, and each session is then a censored view of that original vector. This reinforces the notion that every neuron is actually there and firing away on every trial. We just only see a subset of cells and brain regions for any given session. We actually tackled a much simpler problem in the published LFADS paper using data where we record a new population of neurons from the same patch of motor and premotor cortex across many recording sessions. We developed an approach we call dynamical neural stitching and showed that this approach works really well for inferring stable, latent, reach-related, single-trial dynamics 
as depicted by the similar trajectories across sessions in these colorful plots on the right. The core idea is simply to use a unique readout for each session's group of neurons, which transforms the rates, the factors, into rates for that session. Everything else is shared across sessions, including the factor readout from the RNN. This leaves us with a single dynamical model capable of generating all of the data. So in order to extend this idea to many brain regions, we're going to make a few more changes to LFADS. The first and primary one is to use what I call a two-stage readout. Instead of going straight from factors to neurons, we'll instead go from factors to smaller sets of subfactors associated with each brain region. One way to think about this is that it operationalizes the hypothesis that a given brain region exhibits only a small subset of the dynamical patterns exhibited by the entire brain. Another is to think of each brain region's population state as being a low-dimensional readout of some global brain-wide state. From these subfactors, we then read out the firing rates of each neuron as before, but here, neurons in region A are read out only from region A's subfactors, and neurons from region B are only constructed from neuron B, region B's subfactors, and so forth. If you like, you can think of this as enforcing a particular kind of factorization of the readout to, of the factors to neurons transformation. And this factorization, in, how, in turn, helps to fit the stitched model by enforcing common structure across sessions. If we have three sessions, we share the factors to subfactors readout, and only the region to neuron readouts are session specific. So if you record regions A and B first, and then regions A and C on the next session, data from both sessions is, learned to, is used to learn the subset of dynamics that region A will exhibit. Everything upstream of this transformation is shared as well. The other three changes we made I'll go through quickly, and they're more technical changes in the weeds of the model architecture, so feel free to zone out for a minute if you're just waiting for pretty trajectories. Going back to our cartoon from earlier, one difficulty we encounter is that because each brain region can exhibit somewhat distinct dynamics, the data we feed the model from different sessions can have quite different distributions in neuron space. But we know that the global brain states we would get if we could record from every neuron would look somewhat consistent, at least in distribution across sessions, since the mouse is doing the same task every day. So what we want is to encourage the distribution of latent codes that the encoding side of the algorithm chooses to be similar in distribution across sessions. We do this in two ways. First, we add a set of alignment encoders upstream of the existing encoding machinery, essentially another smaller RNN whose job is to map from the raw input data, which differs quite a bit across sessions, into a representation which is more similar across sessions. And secondly, we borrow some ideas from the deep learning community that try to encourage variational autoencoders to learn what they call disentangled representations. We do this by adding some things to the cost function that depend on the batchwise distribution of these latent codes. We will also be feeding data from multiple sessions into a model simultaneously during training and trying to match the moments of the batchwise distributions for each session. In other words, if these scatter plots on the right represent the latent codes for trials from session one and session two, the left is bad because the distributions are different, which will cause the generating RNN to take two different paths through state space depending on the session, rather than stitching the sessions together with similar generating dynamics. I'd highlight that an analogous approach was used in a paper with Sarah Soya in trying to find a stable latent alignment for motor cortical data in work related to what she presented yesterday. And lastly, we rewrote the code to be a little bit more performant by leveraging updated TensorFlow constructs and getting things training on TPUs. OK, so some results. We train our model with about 29,000 trials and 24,000 neurons across all the recording sessions, and we're able to reproduce the spiking data reasonably well. One way to get a high-level picture of how the model is operating is to plot the factor trajectories, which, as I said, can be thought of as an estimate of a neural population state. These trajectories are estimated on single trials, but I'll start by showing you some blockwise trial averages progressing from thirsty to fully sated. First, thirsty trials. During baseline, the factors are relatively static, slide. but when the odor is presented, the factors begin a large excursion that proceeds into the response period where the animal begins licking. You can see lick-related wiggles emerging that aren't fully washed out by averaging over trials. Next, the late thirsty trials, largely the same path, although the loop is slightly smaller. Next, the early sated trials where the animal is no longer licking reliably. We see that the response to odor is suppressed and doesn't proceed into the large loop that would normally accompany the licking response. And lastly, the final trials in the session where the sensory response appears, but then is quickly suppressed nearly entirely. How might the dynamics accomplish this? 
If we rotate this view, we see that at baseline and throughout the full trial, the trajectories appear to are separated along an orthogonal axis. We might intuit that the dynamics are set up to gate the sensory response as we move closer to sated and enable a full licking response as we move closer to thirsty. And zooming out a bit, as promised, we see that the single trial, the single trial factor trajectories follow paths consistent with the trial average. Consistent with this intuition, we can look at the initial conditions that LFADS chooses for each trial. Visualizing these using TSNI, we can see that the motivational state of the animal is reliably encoded in the initial conditions, from which we can decode thirsty versus sated with above 90% accuracy. And the time-varying inferred inputs are a bit more complex, but they do convey the odor identity, which we can intuit would be to direct the dynamics towards lick or no lick. And lastly, we might want to characterize and compare different brain regions. Having this model, we directly can look at how similar the region-specific dynamics LFADS picks for each region are. We can take these readout weights and compute a similarity metric between regions and then visualize this with multidimensional scaling, which readily reveals proximity between olfactory regions, including piriform and olfactory areas, and more motor-related regions, including the striatum, colliculus, somatosensory motor cortex, motor thalamus, and some brainstem, brainstem motor regions as well. So wrapping up, we implemented an extension to LFADS that enables stitching of brain-wide ethys datasets, where neurons are recorded in many brain regions. Fit to, the, fit to this data set, our model utilizes a thirst-dependent mode of activity to dynamically gate, to perform dynamic gating in an odor-cued licking task. We have a lot of work to do towards validating this model, especially looking at the more complex, higher-frequency features of the data in some regions, and we'd also like to use some multi-neuropixel probe recordings as ground truth to validate the stitching process. Looking forward, I think there's a lot one can learn by looking at this learned model's generative dynamics, and I'm particularly interested in trying to use this approach as a tool to better understand the effects we see in causal experiments, where we might stimulate some region and want to better understand both the direct and indirect effects on ongoing dynamics throughout the brain. And lastly, I just want to mention that in a parallel effort, Chetan Pandaranath, now at Emory, and his postdoc Reza have been working on optimizing vanilla LFADs for large data sets and to use population-based training methods in order to automatically optimize hyperparameters in a principled way, which might be of interest to people once the manuscript appears. Um, so I'd like to very much acknowledge Will Allen, who collected all of this data and has been instrumental in helping to figure out what to do with it, and David Cicillo, who has advised me on every stage of this process from the beginning to the implementation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have time for some questions. Can you specify a little bit more this this graph, the three uh, encoder controller generator, how this works together? Um, yeah, sorry. So I, I tried to simplify the schematic in the talk. Um, the the gist is that the everything up until these initial states and inputs is the encoding side, and here we're calling it the encoder, but it's essentially what predicts the initial conditions. This is just the starting point where this RNN starts, and then the controller is what spits out these time varying inputs that are what can drive the dynamics in ways that aren't predicted from the beginning of the, of, from the initial condition alone. Um, so there's, yeah, I realize there's a lot going on here, um, but essentially this is what I talked about earlier, about the two-stage readout, and this is just the encoding process of picking the initial conditions and picking the inputs for a given trial. So your task is pretty easy in equating go, no go with order identity. It's a little simplistic. Uh, did you have any error trials, and did you learn anything from them? Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, I agree that the task is simple. In some sense, that's kind of a, uh, kind of the intention too. Is that for at least for this modeling effort, that the we, you know we have a good intuition for what's happening, what might be happening in the brain, how this gating might work, and so we can look for specific things. Whereas, you know, if we start with a model that we bar a task that we barely understand, it would be a little bit harder. Um, for error trials, I think there, uh, there are few where there are, I mean, it's hard, so for go trials, there are many at the end where he chooses not to lick because he's sated. But that's sort of the, the point of the trial. I'm not sure if there are very many um, accidental licks on the wrong odor in, in these animals, but it would be interesting to dive into those more. Yeah. Maybe two more questions. Um, that was very nice uh, work and, and a nice presentation. I was 
I was wondering, um, the uh, three-dimensional sort of interpretation of the network that you showed at the end was, was very compelling, but I imagine there must be a lot going on in the higher dimensions, and <coughs> maybe you could comment. Yeah, no, it's absolutely the case. Um, so each, so, you know, the, I think, I think that picture with the sort of top PCs of the factors that we visualize are sort of the overall structure of just make a motor movement to, to do the licking in response to the odor and have that gradually disappear, or abruptly disappear when the mouse becomes sated, I mean. Um, as you look further in, yeah, there are lots of interesting things. There are, um, a, if you looked at a, a raster of cells in olfactory or in, a, sorry, midbrain motor related regions, you can see time locked responses to licking. And certainly those high, higher frequency things are present in the factors as well. And so it does capture those things, but we're still sort of diving in to see like what are, what are how do all these, you know, dynamics at different time scales and for different purposes uh, coalesce. I, I, yeah, we're still early days for that. So one of the beauties of this LPADS is using the recurrent neural networks to generate dynamics. And you use initial conditions to specify the, to specify the instance in which you are. Um, there is also in your diagram an entry for, for um, time dependent inputs, which would yeah. be very important because they would make the system non-autonomous. Yeah. However, you put those only in the model for the global brain and you don't allow for autonomous inputs to operate independently in the various regions. Hmm. So how serious do you think that is as a limitation in your model? So that's a great point, Sarah. Um, I think that one of the biggest things is that we have the dynamics operating in one big all-to-all -all connected network, and the brain regions are sort of readouts from that. What we don't have is what I think we'd all really want, which is, one model for each brain region, and they communicate with each other along a connectivity graph that we derive from tracing experiments or data. Um, I think that makes sense as a direct, and in, if you had that graph, then, then you could provide inferred inputs to individual regions. We can't do that with what we have now, but I think, I think that direction makes a lot of sense. It just requires a lot more uh, knowledge about the nature of the circuit, um, and we, yeah, and, and about what's going on. So I think this is our first cautious step into the void of trying to model all of this at once and you know, ultimately ending up with a real brain network model would, would, be, would be great. You got a quick one, John? Yeah, quick one. Yep. Uh, can you tell us anything about the direction of information flow between the brain regions? Have you thought about how to approach that? <laughs> I think that, yeah, I think that would be interesting to get at. It's not, it's not something that I can think of how to do easily from this, because I, as I was saying, there's one model that has the dynamics, and then we build brain regions by reading out from that, as opposed to having brain regions directly inform each other. Um, there are some interesting ideas that we've thought about looking at with um, looking at like phase relationships. So if a given set of regions are activated in sequence in advance of a reach uh, of a lick, then uh, <laughs> then um, they will be, you know, can we, does LFADS predict that? Is it consistent with what we see in data? If we do pairwise recordings, is it consistent? There are some experimental predictions we make there, but it isn't necessarily operating that way in the recurrent neural network in the model. Okay, let's uh, thank Dan again. Um, <laughs>